Claire, good morning to you. Thank you so much for staying on the AM show. Earlier you had Benjamin speaking to al Hassan Suhini on important matters uh, currently in the country. It's now time for us to fix our focus in Boku. The Kusasis and Mamprusis in that conflict are worried about how the Upper East Regional Security Council is handling the crisis. They say authorities are not dealing with the real threats to peace and security in the area. Well, guess what? The Upper East Regional Minister Stephen Yakubu and Rexek decided to meet the feud and factions to listen to their concerns. Correspondent Albert Sori reports. The Upper East Regional Minister Stephen Yakubu led the Regional Security Council to Boko with one mission in mind to try one more time to broker peace between the Kusasi and Mamprusi ethnic groups which have been involved in a chieftaincy dispute for many years now that has resulted in the loss of hundreds of lives. Last week, eight people were killed in an incident described by natives of the Zorgen suburb of Boko as an attack on innocent civilians by the military charged with the duty of maintaining peace in the volatile town. The Ghana Armed Forces later denied the allegations in a press statement. As head of the Regional Security Council, the Regional Minister must lead investigations into the incident. But first, he needs to calm the people down. He arrives at Boko at the palace of the Paramount Chief, Naba Asigri Aburago Azoka II, and makes this passionate appeal to the chief and his elders and people. We all know banks have closed, schools have closed, hospitals have closed, commercial activity is completely almost zero. People are scared. What are we doing? Let us seek peace. The minister then gave an opportunity for representatives of the Ghana Health Services and the Ghana Education Service who were part of the entourage to talk to the people about how the conflict was affecting these sectors in the Boko municipality. In Boko alone, we have lost as many as 70 of mothers who are dying because they wish they could get access to health workers to be able to give them timely health interventions. But whilst the rep from the Ghana Education Service was speaking, sporadic gunfire suddenly could be heard in the distant atmosphere. But in 2022, inter-district transfers alone was nine, 95. 95 left local municipality to other districts in the region and 85 First, the gunfire was brief, so he was urged to continue with his address. But the gunfire resumed, this time louder and for a longer period. That the conflict in Boko has robbed us of a teacher of Methodist Junior High School. People around started getting alarmed. But again, the speaker was urged to ignore it and continue with his speech. However, this man would not take it anymore. He felt that what was happening did not make any sense. A pandemonium ensued. The Boko Naba was escorted back into his palace and the Kusasi people did not hesitate to express how they felt about how the security of Boko was being handled. To them, the leaders were just scratching the surface and not dealing with the real threats to the security of Boko like the perpetrators of the gunfire that had just been heard. The minister appealed for calm and the meeting continued. However, after he said his goodbyes and was about to leave the Boko Nabes palace, his vehicle was nearly mobbed by an angry, onlooking crowd who were still expressing their frustrations. <laughs> the 
Next, the regional minister, Stephen Yakubu, met the elders and people of the Mamprusi faction. He made the same appeal as before. Let's put our guns down. Let's talk. Let's seek peace. The Mamprusis too did not hide their feelings about how the government was handling the security situation in Boko. You, the security, they are here. They will tell you they know where the problems are coming from. But why is it that they cannot map our strategy to ensure that this bandit will not continue to disturb the peace that we are enjoying in Boko? It's because of politics. And we always blame you, regional minister, as head of Rexec. Every day I blame you. I'm talking with people's lives. The salmon paid over 300 and something police were deployed in Boku for the celebration of salmon paid festival. But just after the celebration of the salmon paid festival, we don't even know when the police left Boku. Is salmon paid festival now a priority to Rexec than the lives, the precious lives that have been lost in Boku? This was the Upper East Regional Minister's response after hearing all sides. I can assure you that we have heard you. We were expecting all what you have told us. We were expecting to be angry. We are expecting you to be telling us this. Yes. But we can tell you that we are not sleeping. We are doing all what we can to bring peace to work. So give us the trust. Trust in us. Inshallah, one day all of us we will sit down and eat together as before. I will come here and do my campaign as before. I always come here and do my campaign. <laughs> as we departed Boko, the general atmosphere was calm and people appeared to be going about their everyday life activities. But one could almost reach out and touch the tension in the air. Albert Sorry, Joy News. Boko. That was a report put together by my colleague Albert Sori, who is correspondent for us in the Upper East region. Well, he joins us via Zoom with more on this issue. Hello, Albert. Uh, good morning to you. Now, we know that the military says it foiled a, a bomb attack on a bridge in Boku. And, 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 and it's, it's getting worrying because the Minister for Defence himself, brief in Parliament, appeared quite frustrated at the situation and, and, and said that we needed to pay more attention to Boku. Uh, tell us what the aftermath of that is because we're hearing from the, um, uh, the MP for the area that it was possibly an attack against the military because that is the bridge they use in getting into the community. What more are we learning on that? As many. So the first time that I heard about this was during the minister's visit to Boko, uh, which I just put together in that report. Now, it was during his visit to the Mapusi faction that um, a young uh, man who was chosen by the elders to speak on their behalf uh, mentioned it uh, almost in passing because he was just talking about all the threats and all the things that have been happening in the town that he felt the security were not actually dealing with. So he mentioned that uh, a day or two after the recent incident involving the military, uh, some people, you know, planted explosives under that bridge and tried to blow it up. Now, the security, according to him, went there and saw the place and they confirmed that that attempt was actually made. And he actually put this to the uh, municipal security council members who were present at the meeting and told them that if he was lying, they should tell him that he was telling lies. But nobody said anything. Now, during the minister's response, he did not mention anything about uh, the bridge. So uh, we decided not to you know, uh, put so much emphasis on it because at the time we didn't have any confirmation from the security about it. So yesterday when the uh, 
uh, defense minister um, mentioned it. I thought that, okay, so it meant that what the gentleman was saying uh, was actually true. The uh, MP himself has also uh, confirmed that people in Boko have told him about it and he had done his checks and he's uh, trying to get more confirmation on it. So it actually speaks to the fact that uh, this may just have happened because uh, nobody is denying it anymore. But then it, it, it speaks to the, the seriousness of what is happening in Boko at the moment. If you watch the, the report that you just did, everyone, every member uh, of, of, of the community in Boko are not happy about what is going on. And uh, everybody is making it known. They are making it known to the government that enough is not being done. Because just imagine that the Red Set, with all the sirens and all the police escorts that accompanied us to Boko, and they were there trying to see how to maintain the peace, some people were still firing gunshots. Mm. It, it, it was just an indication that uh, people don't seem to even be afraid about the security apparatus anymore, mm, mm. and it's becoming a worrying situation. D definitely. Now, the other worrying thing is the possibility of terrorists taking advantage of this and infiltrating. Um, about a week ago, we heard from the regional minister who raised these concerns. Just yesterday, uh, we heard from the defense minister as well. Tell us if you know what is being done in real terms um, in avoiding that infiltration we fear. Yes, so the, um, the, the month of January was when we started getting more refugees. Uh, since 2019, uh, we are told, uh, some refugees from neighboring villages in Burkina Faso started arriving in the country. But last month, more of them arrived because of terrorist activity just across the border. Now, from what we are told, um, they, they mounted you know, surveillance around the borders and they are making sure that even the, the refugees who are trooping in are screened. Uh, one of the people who are spoken to us about that is the district chief executive for, for West, where most of these refugees are in the communities of Satelga and other places. And he tells us that, you know, they, they are screening all these people very well to be sure that uh, they are not even being traced by the people who chase them into the country and all of that. So the, the terrorism situation is um, it's real. They are, they are, they are, the security apparatus are worried about it. But what we are told is that they are monitoring the borders. They are surveilling um, all our entry points to be sure that nobody uh, comes into the country uh, to cause problems for us in Boko. But uh, the, 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 the problem is that with security matters like this, you don't actually get to see what they are doing. Mm. And when things like this continue to happen, uh, you know, the general public just feels that maybe just enough is not being done to help the situation. But we are told that they are surveilling the, the borders and uh, some of the unapproved and all of that. There are joint security operations that are patrolling these places. And uh, they are making sure that nothing uh, threatens the security of the country. One of the gentlemen who spoke when the minister visited the factions um, raised concerns about the number of police deployed to the area. And he felt that when the, is it the Sam, Sam Pandi Festival? Is that it? Samampi Festival, um, there was a deployment of about 300 people there, uh, 300 officers there, and now they don't seem to have those numbers. For him, that shows a lack of commitment in fighting. Was there a direct response to uh, the, the, the number of personnel deployed to the area? Do we know if there's going to be a beef up? Yes, so the regional minister did not respond directly to this particular uh, comment. Now, um, what we know is that security have been stationed in Boko for a very long time. Now, even uh, when we visited on Monday, there were uh, a whole lot of security men, uh, you know, from from different parts of, uh, you know, the, the security uh, apparatus. So you had men from the 
army you had uh, police and even sometimes fire officers are detailed in some of the places so uh, you could tell that you know security presence was in the town the concern uh, when it came to Saman people was that this is a festival celebrated by the Kusasi people and maybe the government just felt that if they didn't put enough men on the ground, maybe uh, something, you know, bad would happen as they celebrated the festival. And that may explain why there were so many people on the ground on that day. But you get the sense that people feel, you know, if you could get these people, this number of security people to come and try to maintain peace in the town during the festival, you should be able to do the same thing when people's lives are being lost. And that is, uh, you know, the, the concern for many people. The security are on the ground, but oftentimes you still get sporadic gunfire, even during curfew hours. And many people are concerned that um, the real perpetrators of the violence are being left off the hook, and it appears that the Regional Security Council is just scratching the surface when it comes to this matter. You know, so, um, and this, these are concerns from both factions as far as this incident, uh, uh, what is happening in Boko is concerned. So that, that is just um, the general situation, the general feeling that people have about how the government is handling the situation. Prior to meeting the factions, the minister had mentioned that a roadmap needed to be developed. Is this meeting a part of it, and what's the next step? Yes, yeah, so he said that um, if you look at what happened last week when uh, those people were killed and the military was accused, an accusation which they denied, uh, the research feels that now there are you know, two sides to the story and as a neutral security uh, body, they will have to go in to investigate. But you get the sense that the Regional Security Council felt that before they can do any investigations, they needed to get into the town and you know make the people feel that they are with them and they are doing everything to try and control the situation. Bernice, when we arrived at both factions, the, before the minister would speak, he actually took time to let everybody stand up and observe a minute's silence for the people who lost their lives, just to give the people that feeling that the uh, government is mourning with them and is um, with them in this time of difficulty. So, yes, the, 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 the sense you get is that they will do the investigations from here out, but they needed to calm down the people. If uh, they, they released the statements, in which they urge the people not to try to um, confront the military because of the anger they had been feeling following last week's incident. So they needed to uh, build on that step to make sure that they calm down the people and then the investigations will continue. Uh, at the moment, we haven't heard from Rexeg yet as to uh, exactly what they would do. But normally, they don't they don't give too much away when it comes to what they are doing on the ground. So. Um, I'm not sure, you know, uh, we, we will know what exactly they are doing. But as and when they feel that the public needs to know the steps they have taken, they normally would either issue a press statement or call a media briefing and let us know. Thank you, uh, Albert. I'll ask you to hold on while I engage with Awal Ahmed Kariyama. He's Executive Director, Rural Initiatives for Self-Empowerment Ghana, that's Rights Ghana is an NGO that works in the northern part of the country. It's based there as well. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kariyama, for joining us. Now, one critical aspect to this whole conflict has to do with the human rights angle and the fact that there may be feuding factions, but there are those who suffer as a result of these conflicts and activities, and primarily women and children. Tell us if your work extends especially to the Boko area and what you've observed over the years. Yes, so thank you very much for the opportunity and good morning to you and the management as well as the listeners and the good people of Boko and the Upper East Region in general. Uh, the situation of Boko is very unfortunate. There is no aspect of human rights that has not been violated or abused in, since the Boko conflict re-erupted. 
way back in November 2021. So we are talking about the fact that the resurgence of this conflict has dragged from November 2021 to date. And in between that, you know, we, Ghana as a country, sovereign state has ascribed to protect and uphold the citizens' rights in terms of from the right to survival, right to food, economic and cultural rights and all mm -hmm. that. And when you situate that to Boko, all these rights are being violated. We are talking about the fact that the freedom of movement by people to be able to conduct their business from one place to another is restricted. We are talking about the fact that the right to life and survival of women and children especially is violated. And then also that of men and boys as well. So there are serious security lapses in the area. There are serious citizens' impunity in the area that has tend to undermine the very fundamental rights of the citizens of Boko. We have seen people going about their business and they have been accosted mm -hmm. and shot and killed. Mm -hmm. And we have seen citizens make serious allegations about extrajudicial killings in terms of involvement of state security apparatus in the maintenance of the conflict to the extent that people are accusing military of killing their citizens, people are accusing of military of entering their homes during KFU hours. And I think that these things have not been given the needed attention, national attention that it deserves. So because of that, a lot of this continued to happen. I mean, way back in 2008, there have been allegations of military involvement. And how much have we investigated this matter? And what feedback have we given to the citizenry? Look, as we sit today, our work in Boko, we have realized that there is a breakdown of trust mm. and legitimacy of state institutions. We are talking about the fact that the RECSEC is a very impartial body, a very independent body that seeks to build and sustain peace in the Boko area. But as we speak, both factions do not trust the RECSEC. Mm. As both factions do not trust the RECSEC, it's difficult for the RECSEC to, RECSEC to be able to initiate measures that will bring lasting peace to the area. Number two, when you consider the fact that among the two fielding factions, there is no trust, to the extent that if a Kusasi man goes to the Mampusi territory to commit suicide, normal suicide, it will not be seen as a suicide. If a Mampusi man goes to a Kusasi territory to commit suicide, it will not be seen as a normal suicide. They will take it as if that person has been killed by the other faction. So there is breakdown of trust. And then also, there is a lot of political interference in terms of handling the matter. There are certain drastic measures that clearly need to be taken. I mean, we're not talking about, as a human rights organization, we'll not talk about any draconian measures or extrajudicial measures that will abuse the right of the citizenry. But we need to also understand and put it in context that whereas we exercise our rights, our rights ends where another person's loads begins. So if you want to express yourself, that vehicle should be there for people to be, for people to be able to use due process mm. to express themselves. What are these drastic measures you talk you, 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 you so, talk about? So, for instance, recently the Regional Security Council initiated a measure where they ban the use of tricycles, popularly known as can-do. And during that period, we know that a lot of livelihoods were lost, a lot of people couldn't earn a living. Mm. But it brought some sanity. The guns went silent in the area. But there was a lot of back and forth, and then one of the things we need to also look at is information management and propaganda. There's a lot of propaganda and disinformation and fake news in Boko going through social media, and so that affects the ability of the security to even collect the intelligence. So that drastic measure of banning the tricycles and the can do resulted in a situation where the guns went silent. Mm. But you have to look at it and balance it with the ability of the people to earn a livelihood. Mm. So based on that, and then after several appeal, the RECSEC rescinded that decision, and they reintroduced this. But then the guns started blazing again. And it's unfortunate, I pity the, let me use the opportunity to say good morning to the Honorable Upper East Regional Minister and the entire membership of RECSEC. We have worked as an organization in terms of border security and others, and mm. we know how difficult this situation is. And so I, I, I pity the Honorable Regional Minister in that he has a difficult task. Mm. Both sides are accusing him of not doing his work, and both sides are accusing the RECSEC of security labs. It's a very difficult situation to work. So going forward, we want to be able to see that there is constant feedback and communication between the citizenry and the various security authorities so that whatever there is information in terms of intelligence gathering, mm. there is feedback, there is finality to issues 
like when somebody is accused and then there is a report, let us get a conclusive report. And the RECSEC, we know that it's a security mm. work they are doing. So it's not everything they can come out to the Definitely. public. Definitely. But feedback is very important. Mm. And because without feedback, then you lose your legitimacy. When you lose your legitimacy, then it becomes difficult for people to volunteer information, to trust you, mm. as well as to rely on you for their safety. And so when people feel that the state cannot protect them, they unfortunately resort to use of extremism. And in this case, violent extremism. And I sit here to say that the case of Boko, there is a lot of violence extremism going on. People do not have trust in the system again because over the years they feel that that solution has not been granted when somebody is abused, their rights is violated or killed. They don't get access to justice. Mm. Earlier you, you mentioned that this situation has not received as much national attention as you would want. What will constitute that needed national attention for you? Yes, so first of all, let me also use the opportunity to commend the Parliament of Ghana. Yesterday, they had a very passionate and informative discussion about Boko. Mm. And for me, that is just a beginning. And those are the kind of dialogues that we want to have. We should put Boko in the radar. You know why? Boko is a border town. Boko has border with two countries, Burkina Faso and Togo. And you just don't want one border. Okay, so we are at a place where, you know, other places people are interested in forming their own country. Mm. And people can use Boko as a test case to just try to form their own country. And then when they do that, it will mean that part of our northern borders will not be secure for us. So Boko is a very delicate area that we must pay urgent attention to here and now. And I said the parliament started by discussing it yesterday. Mm. Beyond that, I think that they need to form a committee, an impartial committee of inquiry to look into the issues of Boko. Boko problem is older than some of us. Mm. Way back in the 50s, mm -hmm. okay, way back in the independence era that it started. Why is it that we're not able to fix it? Is it that we don't have the expertise when in this country we can go to other places and provide technical support in terms of resolving conflict? And so once we begin discussing it at the parliament, we should go a step further to set up a committee from something like the eminent chiefs, committee of eminent chiefs, to look into the matter what are the various stakes that are on the table? Present the various stakes and then use it and bring a finality to the issue so that whoever then disagrees with that, there is due process. And once the due process is followed and you disagree, then you face the rigors of the law. Mm. Until we do that, we will be just romancing the matter and touching it on the surface and leaving it. And look, the issue is so serious that, you know, police report is always uh, sometimes, uh, excuse me to say, PR. The police report sometimes is public relations. The actual deaths and the effect as we speak today, one of the key things I'm passionate about is to see the people integrate. Today we have a market for Kusasis, we have a market for Mampusis. Until the people come together, they will not forget that there is conflict. We need to create a symbiotic relationship where people understand that they can interact with each other. And when you come to my market and I go to your market, or we come to a common market, then you know that there is a risk in terms of creating conflict. But when we have people separate, when the segregation, the segregation is, so is and it's getting clear. deeper, unfortunately, mm. Mm. it's getting deeper to the extent that certain people from one side cannot pass to one side. Mm. Mampusis cannot pass through a certain enclave. Kusasis cannot pass through a certain enclave. It's unfortunate. Then it creates a system where even the children and other future generations. And let's 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 put it in context that all the people who are dying from this conflict, needless conflict, senseless conflict, have siblings. They have family. And going forward. What are the families, you get up and you hear that your father or your mother was killed, was slaughtered. I mean, a very old woman was slaughtered. So you get up and hear this story, and people say that they forgive, but they can't forget. We only hope that even everybody can forgive. It's not everybody who forgives. Those who do not forgive, what do they do then? They are reprisals. So we need to be able to provide mm. justice to victims. And the human rights abuses in Boko are way too much. Mm. You're not a security person, but I would just like to take your opinion on this. Do you think it's time for the president to speak to this issue uh, head on and, 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 and talk about it, what his plans are in terms of fixing the situation in Boko. Yes, yeah, so you see, uh, the, the Boko problem also is about chieftaincy. And once it's about chieftaincy, there are established institutions. That is why some, some times you hear people say that Ghana, we have all the laws, only that the laws are not biting or they're not working. We need to make our laws to work effectively. There are established institutions, mandated institutions that are supposed to handle issues of chieftaincy here. And one of the main of Boko problem has been the political interference. 
since independence. Mm. And if we want to rely to His Excellency, the President has a mandate to ensure that the total security of the country is enhanced. However, there is an established institution, which is the House of Chiefs, that has mandate and jurisdiction over looking into chieftaincy affairs. Mm. And once House of Chiefs and other things sit on the matter, they should be able to enforce the law and change and make things as they are and communicate that change and enforce it. So there is a mandated state institution and we should go to those state institutions to bring, because they have been time tested. And look, we're not talking about Boko alone. Boko is only one out of 500 potential cases. It's just unfortunate that the Boko case has dragged because people have taken entrenched positions over the years. But there are other 500 cases in Ghana related to chief tenancy where if we don't take time, unfortunately, they may erupt one day. Mm. And we cannot allow the situation of Boko to be exploited. There are people who are, first of all, there are categories of people who benefit from the situation as it is. Right. Some politicians will not like the problem to be resolved because they benefit from it. There are some people we call conflict entrepreneurs, conflict entrepreneurs who deal in weapons, arms and armory, and they, they, they service a the market. As long as there's a raging conflict, they can service it. A story, there's a very popular story in Boku, which is said that a certain gentleman wanted to sell arms and ammunition to his own people, and the people didn't buy. So he went to another enemy's territory and then fired gunshots into there, and then comes and says that, oh, you see, the people are coming after you. Then he raises the price of, there's, there's that rumor in Boko, raises the price of the weaponry. So there are people who benefit from yeah. this. And mm -hmm. also, one of the key aspects we need to look at is to have a dispassionate and balanced discussion in Boko, where the media gives prominence to the warring factions to be able to express their views. And some of the security aspects, uh, aspects that we um, panel on our radio, uh, TV programs, honestly, some of them are not in touch they do not come from the area. They can't remember the last time they went to the area or did some work in the area. So some of the things they were professing may not be real. They will end up inflaming passions. Because when you hear a certain news about Boko, 90% of the news that comes up is propaganda and fake news. So if you are not careful, you come and sit on air and say certain things, and you will be doing somebody's mm. bidding without knowing. Yeah, and, and that's important because for, you know, sometimes people don't understand why the media is very careful, in particular with the case in Boko, because we, we have received calls, for example, even sometimes when you um, harmlessly engage a certain person, one faction says, well, he belongs to that side, so everything he says is tainted. We don't want him to be involved in the discussion. So it's quite a delicate and a tricky matter. So, I mean, in conclusion, while we work at solving the problem, how do we ensure that in the process human rights are protected and people even amidst the roadmap that the, the government is trying to set up or create to solve the problem, we can still ensure that people's rights aren't violated. Yes, so to solve the problem of human rights abuses, first of all, we need to institute measures. Uh, recently, we issued a press release and we're commending the Northern, Northern East, North East Regional uh, Security Council for taking proactive measures to provide escorts on the roads that lead to North East. We need to provide similar thing for the roads leaving and entering Boko mm. so that they will not be gunshots. Yep. And so first of all, we need to silence the guns. We need to address the culture of impunity. People who commit crime, who kill people, should be brought to book immediately. And when they are brought to book immediately, it will serve as a deterrent to other people. People who feel that their victims have been killed and they have not had access to justice, they will have a feel of the fact that justice is coming. And then they will also not resort to uh, using violence to address their differences. And we need to be able to put in measures where the people integrate. When they integrate, then the issues of uh, abuses here and there, kidnapping of people, shooting at night, and the other things will stop. So um, I, I just want to find out with RISE Ghana, what exactly you're doing in that part of the country, and uh, what the challenges have been, and what it will take for you to exactly execute your mandate? So we have been working seriously to an advocate for police coverage, to increase in the number of police coverage and issues around police accountability. We are concerned about certain uh, dealings of the security apparatus and we've been issuing a number of press releases trying to ensure that uh, all the necessary stakeholders do their bit. We're working with traditional authorities and religious leaders. We're working with a, lo a lot of youth groups to be able to address this. And then we recently, uh, model a poem, and the poem says that uh, first they came, 
it's a poem that is modeled from the Jewish uh, uprising and then the issues of the Nazi killing in Germany. And basically, we're saying that first they came for the, so for instance, they came for the Fulanis. And Boku is a very cosmopolitan and multi ethnic area. Mm. There are Fulanis, there are Bises, there are Mapusis, there are Kusasis, there are several tribes there, there are Dagombes. So we coined a poem from our office uh, and we said that first they came for the Fulanis. I did not speak up because I'm not a Fulani. Then they came for the Busanga. I did not sleep up because I'm not a Busanga. They came for the Kusasi. I did not speak up because I'm not a Kusasi. They came for the Mampusi. I didn't speak up because I'm not a Mampusi. When they came for me, there was no one to speak for me. And that is the situation of Boko. If we don't speak up, each, there is no ethnic group in Boko that has not suffered this gun violence and killing. Mm. So until we speak up, that it concerns everybody. And we need to understand that young people are losing their lives, businesses are collapsing, mm. children are not able to go to school. I mean, it's not proper for you to be deprived of a childhood. If you look at our Children's Act, it says that the best interest of the child must always be promoted. And the best interest of children in Boku is to get the best, better education, to be in school, to have a right to play, to have a right to interact and learn other cultures. But the people of Boku are depriving the children of that right. And until we institute those measures and ensure that people who commit these crimes are brought to book, mm and then sit and judge or and bring lasting solution to it. Boku is not a big deal that cannot be solved. We have the expertise in this country that can solve Boku. We only need the political will and the commitment from both factions to be able to address the issue. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank Awal Ahmed Karyama is Executive Director, Rural Initiatives for Self-Empowerment Ghana, Rice Ghana, and they have been working in northern parts of the country. And uh, today we've been speaking about their work in the Boku area and sharing uh, as well, on, in terms of human rights angle, what should be done to protect the rights of people living there, especially women and children. Well.